objects, and then I will draw some pictures. Um, so the only problem here is, as you can already see it, I should use my little slides here, um, that the set V, that's a vertex set for G, and my pre-chosen vertex set for um, the complete graph, remember that was my labeling 1 to N, they are not the same, right? So in general, Vs could be A, B, C, or whatever, draw hearts, stars, whatever you like. So the only thing we kind of need to make sure is that we relabel everything appropriately. And this is what the map below here will do. It just relabels um, the edges. So it is a map from this one to the other one. It just relabels my edges VI to I. Okay. Um, and then I have my edge set here. Uh, and it was the most, so this is the edge set of KN. And it was the biggest possible, just all edges. And I just pick the correct subset uh, just exactly in this, in this way. And so I construct a subgraph, which I call H. So it has now the correct labeling set. It has a labeling set 1 to N. And I pick out the correct, the only thing I'm doing is I'm picking out the edges of V from my graph. I'll draw in a picture in a second. And then I just need to relabel isomorphism um, to make sure that I haven't messed up. And H is actually the subgraph, and G is isomorphic to H. So let me stress again the points here. Um, let, let me first draw a picture of what I actually just did. So ignoring this relabeling nonsense, uh, the relabeling was because my set V was different from N, let me just assume for simplicity that the set V is a set N. Um, then I have my complete graph. The only one I can properly draw, I guess, is this one. So K3. And every graph on three vertices should be a subgraph of this graph. And how do I get it? I get it from K3 by just using the same vertices. So here's my G. By just using the same vertices. And then I just, well, G has some edges. So I just remove edges from, from this picture. Uh, for example, I could do this one. And this then clearly embeds into this picture just exactly in this way. So all I'm doing here, I take the huge edge set EN, and I remove edges until I have the edges of V, uh, of, of G, and then there's some relabeling going on, which in the end is not really important. Right? So I said again, the only thing that happens here is that KN is so huge, it just has all edges. So by, by successively pick, uh, removing edges, you will get any other any other graph that can appear here. Hope that makes some sense. That's really, really simple. And uh, what this is really saying is that our KN is kind of the biggest possible, which makes sense. So we, we can use that all the time. So if you want to show some properties of a generic graph, you might want to study it as a subgraph of KN and show that KN has a correct property, then you might want to push it back uh, to, your, to your graph G. Okay, so the complete graph, kind of the biggest possible. And the only thing, I said again, the only thing is it was really done here was removing edges. And then there was this relabeling nonsense coming from the isomorphism, which I encourage you to ignore um, for most purposes. They're really not so important. It's just the choice of my labeling set. Okay. Um, so there's one property which I would like to study now. Remember, the idea is we have those graphs. They eventually will model something in real life. So we would like to study mathematical properties of graphs, which only depend on the graph and not on some labeling or other stuff. So really on the intrinsic properties of a graph. And well, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is we would like to look at the diagrams more closely. Um, and the no notion I would like to address here is the notion of a planar graph. So planar is the plane which you see here in the background. So this is always my little plane R2. And I would like to do it in a way that no edges cross. And I call that a plane. I re remember every graph had realizations. And if no edges cross, I call it a planar embedding of a graph. Um, we'll show examples in a second. But note the difference that a graph uh, with a planar embedding, by definition, is a planar graph. But a graph uh, can be planar, and it can have non-planar embeddings. We'll see examples right now. So planar really comes from plane, which is the background here 
of my slides anyway, so it's very convenient. Kind of the first thing you would try, because the plane is so nice, we could draw on the plane. So the first thing you would try is um, to get those started. So examples, right? So the only thing that matters here are examples. Um, so here's a good example. So I will go through all of them in a second. But here's a good example. So this is my graph K4, and these are two drawings of the same graph. It's really the same graph if you stare at it. The only, uh, well, you can see it. So this edge, like any other edge, is connected to everything else. And it doesn't change whether I redraw my edges or not. But it depends now on the drawing. So the right-hand side is a plane I embedding. The left-hand side is not a plane I embedding because you have this little crossing here in the middle. Yeah, see this crossing here? This is not a plane I embedding. The graph is then planar because it admits at least one planar embedding. So the K4 is actually a planar graph. So this is K4 and this is planar. Um, this is just what I said here, right? So graphs can have planar embeddings. They can have many of them. Not every realization needs to be planar. Well, here's an example. And it can get pretty crazy. So in general, it might be a bit tricky. We'll see some examples to decide whether a graph actually is planar. Because usually, in the wild, you will see graphs coming around in a certain form. For example, this is given to you, and you kind of need to find this presentation, which in this case might be not so hard. But imagine you have a really complicated graph. So we need some, some nice tools to decide um, whether a graph is planar. And we'll see them, not today, but later, certainly. OK, so uh, easier examples maybe. The past graphs are planar. What do I need to do to prove that? Well, the only thing I need to do is I need to show you a planar embedding. Well, there you go. Planar embedding of the past graph. This is P4. Um, you could clearly imagine that Pn just does the same. It's just one line uh, all the way up to n. The cyclic graphs are planar. How do I prove that? Well, I show you a planar embedding. Here is one. Um, so there you go. This guy here is C5, I would guess. And in general, of course, you just have your points along the circle. And because it, it traces out a circle, it will be planar. So this traces out a line, this traces out a circle. Uh, the third example, K4, is planar in a less obvious way. But I showed you a planar embedding, a crossing less embedding of K4. Um, I'd like to stress again that the slight difference here between a graph being planar and seeing a planar embedding. Right? Again, on the left, uh, what is it? The southwest, you see an example of a graph which is planar but does not, well, the left hand embedding is certainly not, uh, the left hand picture is certainly not planar. So keep that in mind. That's kind of a little bit playing with words. Um, so whenever someone asks you, is a graph planar, what you need to do is you need to show them a planar embedding. That makes some sense. So here's some more examples. Um, and that's kind of the, well, if, let's think about the proposition from before. Um, let's say, well, we have this proposition. So everything is a subgraph of Kn. And I get it by successively removing edges. Right? So if, well, ignoring loops and double edges, uh, duplicate edges. So I get it successively by removing edges. OK, so let's. Study now those graphs, the complete graphs. If they would be planar for all n, then all graphs would be planar because I could just draw a plane diagram, a planar diagram, and successively remove edges, which doesn't add any crossing. Okay, so um, we have seen. Well, here are three planar embeddings of uh, k1, k2, k3, and we have seen the first one. Uh, this is kind of the wrong picture. I actually have chosen the wrong one here. I should have used this one which is a correct picture in this case. Uh, so this is also planar. So you might wonder, what about the higher ones? And it turns out, but we can't prove that right now. We'll prove that later, that from K5 onwards, you can't find a planar embedding of, of this beast. Okay. Um, let's think about a second whether this is tricky or not. Um, OK, you, what, what would you do if you would need to decide whether K5 is planar? Maybe you would play around a little bit, draw whatever, 15 different pictures, and you would kind of convince yourself that there's just no way for it to cross. But how do you then formally show that it's not planar? It's very different, because you would kind of need to, uh, uh, or in, in total, kind of study all possible pictures at once 
and show that not, not a single one is planar. So it's a priori not clear. I just, I just claim this as a fact. I, I don't assume you to see that immediately. I claim that as a fact that this is not planar, and we'll see that later. And that's not really surprising because in the end, well, there should be some distinctions between grass being planar and grass not being planar. And if K, the K ends would be planar, um, then everything would be planar and the notion would be kind of a little bit silly. Right? If everything satisfies the property, the, the property is a little bit silly. So from K5 on, onwards, okay, but we can do this one now. So why is K6 not planar if we know K5 is not planar? Well, no matter how we draw K6, there will always be a K5 diagram in K6. So knowing that K5 is not planar, we know that K6 is not planar. Good. And then K7 is not planar and so on. So, so from here we get this one, from here we get this one, and we have the whole tail up to Kn not planar. The only thing missing is uh, whether K5 is planar or not. Okay. Um, so let's believe that for a second. So from, from somehow something miracle happens here and you count the first four, they are good, and the fifth one uh, then falls apart. And that happens relatively often uh, with graphs that you come in families and those are just a little bit too simple for them. All of them is planar, but they have really, really simple graphs. So, uh, Roughly speaking, if your graph has too many edges, there's a good chance that it is not planar because you need to take care of crossings between edges. I hope that makes some sense. And of course, the graph with the most possible edges, the K6, or sorry, the Kn, um, is, well, <laughs> it, it's very hard to get rid of those crossings. You could convince yourself very quickly that it's hard, but anyway, showing it is, is, is much trickier. I hope that makes some sense. But we can do the following. It's really beautiful, and I show you the proof. The proof is amazing, uh, very simple. So we can't do it um, in R2, but we can do it in R3. So here, if I would have a graph now in my hands, I could, I, it, it would be without, without crossings. I could find um, some form of it without crossings. So R2, in some sense, is not good enough, so drawing them might fail, but in R3, you can always do it. Again, this is not quite obvious, but you will see the proof. The proof is amazing. It's a very simple idea. And then it will be obvious. So R2 is too small, and R3 is big enough in some sense. You have enough space to put your edges if you want, and we'll see that in a second. Um, graphs are low-dimensional objects. That's what this theorem is kind of saying, right? They are, hmm, they are one-dimensional objects, so you might wonder whether they live nicely in two space. They don't quite. Not everything lives nicely in two space in the sense that you still have, could have crossings, but in three space you're good. So they're certainly some kind of low-dimensional objects. We'll see flavors of that theorem uh, throughout topology, throughout the whole lecture. Okay, so here's the proof. Um, I do the following. So let me ignore loops and duplicate edges for now. Uh, so the only thing I need to do, keeping this proposition in mind, the previous proposition, um, where is it? This one here, okay, is I would need to embed Kn into R to the N. I can do this as follows. I just think of a book. I have a book here. In this case, I have a book with, uh, what is it? Three pages. Uh, along the binding of the book, I just put all the vertices one, two, all the way up to n. And then I just, uh, have, I just add as many pages as I need to make the uh, edges not cross. I could use, for example, one page per edge. I, I can do better, like for K5, three pages are enough. But in principle, I could use one page per edge. And because in R3, I can just have my book as being as big as I want. There you go, that's an embedding of Kn into uh, what is it, R to the N. So I have my books, my pages here all the way, and I could use per edge, I could, if I want, could use uh, one book page. Uh, I could do better. I just listed it here, the minimum that you need. Okay, so every Kn using this book type of batting um, actually lives in R3, and of course a book lives in R3. You just open a book, and then you have it, it lives in R3. Uh, perfect, so this is kind of great, this is kind of a great idea. 
Um, and well, what can we do with loops? Well, you can do the same thing, of course, and you can just put, again, each loop on a sec uh, separate page. What, this was not a good idea. I just put a sec separate page here, and I put a loop for my page, and uh, I can do the same for duplicate edges anyway. So, uh, so those, those pieces are actually quite easy. Uh, okay, so I, I, I personally feel like this is a cool proof. Um, you might disagree, or you, do, you can agree, or whatever, but it's certainly showing that there's a huge difference for graphs between this guy here, um, this is a bad color, uh, this guy here, and the R to the N, which is my page background, uh, so R, R2. So there's a huge difference between them. Um, in R3, I have really enough space, I can do this book picture. Uh, in R2, it's an actually an interesting problem to decide whether a graph is planar or not. Okay, so right now, we don't have any real tools to decide whether a graph is planar, but we will get there eventually. There's some really cool statement about, uh, very easy to check, I give you a graph, you can check it whether it's planar or not, and a very easy type of statement. But we don't have it right now, so just keep that in mind. And I think this is a cool property, uh, being planar or not, that you can study of a graph, it's intrinsic to a graph. The only difficulty is that you kind of need to study all possible embeddings at once. Uh, that's a kind of a problem that we will see throughout um, uh, the lecture. There will be very nice definitions that totally make sense, but then you need to vary over something, a huge set, and they're usually very hard to compute in practice. Okay, planar is a cool property. The next property, whatever you would like to call it, for R3 is boring because every graph satisfies the embedding property anyway. So we don't even have a name for that property. So the, the three-dimensional version of planar doesn't have a name because everything satisfies it anyway. The first property is, is being planar. Uh, usually um, some nice checks for yourself whether a graph is planar. Okay, I would like to go to the second property I'd like to study today, and then there will be a third property, and then we're done. So, okay, so what we do is we study the connectivity of a graph, right, of this, of this graph, whether it's plain or not. So maybe there is some local information that we can use, and maybe it tells us something about the graph. Okay, so we have a graph, and I define the degree of the vertex, vertex of a vertex V as, well, being just the adjacent edges, the number of adjacent edges. So here I have a vertex, and I don't know where the edges go, but locally I can see that my vertex has, what is it, six adjacent edges, so my degree is kind of a local property of the graph. So I can decide here with this V that already, without knowing anything about the graph, except this local picture, that the degree is six. At degree, uh, as usual, don't look at the definitions, look at the examples, it's just defined as a number of adjacent edges. Okay. Let's see whether we can understand. So um, here's a graph, and another graph, and another graph. So let's see. So the degree of the first vertex here is three. Well, we have three adjacent edges, um, and we could see that locally, because they are just loops in this case. Uh, degree of two would be one, right? Degree of two. Very simple. Here we could look at A, for example. Degree of A, if I haven't miscounted, let's do it actually, should be five. So one, two, three, four, and my little loop. So indeed, checks out. Degree of A is five. Degree of B, let's do degree of B as well. Degree of B here, um, I guess, would be two, as far as I can see. So it's really, really easy, really easy to check for each vertex what the degree is. Uh, let's do the past graph. Uh, the degree of four, for example, is two, and so is the degree of any of those internal vertices. Well, and then you have the boundary vertices, and they have degree uh, one. So all of these have degree two, and this one, ha and this one, they have degree one. Okay. Notion of degree hopefully makes some sense. And this is a very specific property of this graph, right? This has degree one and those guys have all degree two. So let's see in our family of examples 
Um, here's also why this graph is very special. So everything in particular vertex four has to be two. So everything has two neighbors. So not just this one actually, but everything, every V here has to be two. Um, on the flip side, really completely the opposite. In the full graph, everything has the highest possible degree. So everything here actually has degree five, which is always, so this is K6. So this five is actually N minus one. Right, so you have N vertices, everything is connected to everything, so everything should have degree N minus one in general. Um, here it's also easy to count. This graph gets very messy as you can see, but it's still a very simple graph because you know actually everything is going on. So degree four, like the degree for everything at the top should be five because everything at the top, remember, is re re connected to everything at the bottom. So degree four, uh, degree of four is five and degree of whatever four prime would be uh, seven, I guess. So here, seven. Uh, like for everything at the bottom. And it's again very easy to count what's going on here. So what, what makes those graphs in some sense special is they have such an easy degree function. So it's, it's, it's essentially constant on the vertices, which is certainly not the case for a gener general graph like this one here. So here the degree goes up and down all the time. So A has five, B has two, D has one, and C has one, for example. So in some sense, what makes our favorite example so easy is that, th that locally on this degree function, they are so simple. Right? So the degree function is now telling us something about the graph. So let's try to play around with it a little bit and see what we can get from it. So here's a cool theorem, actually, and that's, that's really strange. It's kind of one of these local to global, if you want, theorems. So I count degrees, which is kind of a local operation. Remember that I just count degrees along, uh, along the vertex. And I, I don't really see the rest of the graph. And the number of edges is certainly a global information about the graph. And they are related by this really beautiful formula that the, the sum of the degrees is the number of, twice the number of the edges. Okay, let, let us just um, see this here in this example, for example. So uh, every vertex has degree two, okay? So the sum of the degrees is just, in this case, six times two, which is 12, which is, uh, so here I get sum of degrees being 12. And I guess if I'm not miscounting, I have uh, six edges, which is two times the number of edges. And this works in general, which is ridiculous. Uh, kind of ridiculously nice theorem. Really, this is really very surprising. The proof is very easy. We do it in a second. It's again one of those aha moments. Um, really nice proof. B but it, to me, this looks pretty crazy. Uh, very similar to the, to the theorem of the embedding before. I kind of wouldn't believe it because degree is a local information and number of edges is a global information. And they're related in this nice fashion, which is extremely remarkable here. Okay, let's have a look. So this remarkable formula, please keep it in mind. It's relatively simple. So let's have a look at the proof. Oh, by the way, this goes back to Euler. So um, Euler discovered this formula using the following proof, a um, little bit lying, of course, um, without knowing what a graph is, which is very impressive. So without knowing what a graph is, Euler actually discovered this formula. Okay, but let's have a look at the, uh, let's have a look at the proof. So <laughs> why is it called the handshaking lemma? So it's also called the handshaking lemma because of the proof. So the idea of the proof is that you should imagine you have a graph, and what the graph encodes is like you're on a party, and every vertex is a, is a person, and you put an edge between them if they shake hands during the party. Okay, so V and W are two people here, and they shake hands apparently twice. And the point is, if I shake your hand, you shake my, my hand, so there is some doubling going on here, right? So v, sh uh, v shakes hands with W twice, but W, by doubling everything, shakes hands with V twice. So each edge actually contributes twice to this kind of graph here, to the degree, and that's why you get exactly this formula. So just summing over all of the local degrees. It's really just this low, it's kind of very simple again. So if two people shake hands, you always have an even number of handshakes. Very simple. 
because I shake your hand, you shake mine. And we always have an even number of handshakes. And just imagine now to, to be the graph, the one that encodes the handshaking, and you will get there pretty, pretty quickly. It's kind of a really nice argument. Well, you might worry now, is it really formal? Well, it depends a little bit. I think it's cool. But strictly speaking, you could use induction on the number of edges if you want. Um, so Euler's proof is probably more like this one. But you, if you want, you can use induction on the number of edges. So if there is no edge, I think the formula is not very exciting. Uh, so both sides are 0. Right? No edge and no degree to count. It's not very exciting. And otherwise, you remove an edge, uh, use inductively that formula, and put it in again. And as using exactly this argument that, uh, well, if I shake your hand, you shake mine. So one side goes up by uh, 2, because you have 2 times the number of edges, and the other side goes up by 2 as well. Right? Note that this is really just the formal version of the argument from the other side. That's it. OK, I, I think this is a very remarkable formula. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, the proof is, if you, it's, it's, not, it's not really hard. It's actually remar really remarkable. So keep this formula in mind. It's very simple, very powerful. A, a local to global formula. It's really rare in mathematics. Usually, a local property shouldn't determine any global behavior. But here it does. It's very remarkable. OK, so last thing I would like to study is another intrinsic property. So I had planar, I had the degrees, and we will play around with them uh, more, but not today anymore. So we'll still see them. They're not, they're not gone. But I would like to do the last thing I would like to do is another really, again, really strange definition, which turns out to be the correct one. So I would like to study a number. I would like to associate a number to a graph. Graph is a complicated object. Numbers are simpler than graphs. So I associate one number to a graph. I could use, for example, the number of vertices. I could use the number of edges. But Euler came up with this idea to use this invariant of the graph. So the number of vertices minus the number of edges. Looks very strange if you see it for the first time. Let's just go for it. Let's believe Euler was correct here. Um, so this is a good number to study. It's really just a number associated to a graph. And it's called, it's really denoted chi, and it's called the Euler characteristic. Uh, the, naming, the name comes from Euler, who discovered this. Invariant. Again, very impressive without knowing anything about graphs. So uh, very impressive. Euler is a very impressive person. Anyway, so what I really count is the degree 0 parts, and I subtract the degree 1 parts. That's what this counts. Right? The number of edges, the, the edges are kind of a dimension or degree 1 things, and the vertices are dimension or degree 0 things. OK, life is boring without examples. So let's do examples. Oh, this is now counting. Let's hope I've counted correctly here. So what we need to do to get the number on the right-hand side is to write down the number of vertices. I guess the number of vertices here is 3. And I need to count the number of edges. And I hope the number of edges is 4. So 3 minus 4 is indeed minus 1. So this is just 3 minus 4. Very easy to count. This is 3 minus 4. So let's hope I haven't messed up here. Um, four vertices and one, two, three, four, five edges. I guess yeah, it works out as well. And here's the pass graph. So let's try to think about how the pass graph actually works. Mm, OK, so you have n vertices. And how many edges do you have? Well, you have n minus 1 edges. Ooh, you can see it here. One is connected to 2. That's the first edge. 2 is connected to 3. That's the second edge. So this vertex, I should do it here. So this vertex here determines the edge. This vertex determines the next edge. This vertex determines the next edge, and so on. But the last vertex doesn't have an edge anymore. So you have one edge short. So this has no edge anymore. In other words, uh, you have n vertices, and you have n minus 1 edges. So the Euler characteristic is 1. If you don't believe me, we can do a live here. That's always good. Never believe me. Uh, we can do a live here on the graph. So number of vertices is 6, as you can see. And number of edges, if I count correctly, is 5. Uh, this is 1. Does it make some sense here, this idea that each edge is kind of uniquely associated, or you can associate it to a vertex, but the last one 
is kind of the well, it's kind of the poor guy that doesn't get any edge associated. So you undercount one, and the Euler characteristic exactly picks up the undercount here. Very easy to compute. Right now, it's not really clear why that should be useful. Um, the degree kind of intuitively makes sense, but this one is a little bit trickier, but it's actually really good. It's actually really good. There are really cool statements related to the Euler characteristic. We'll see you some. Now let's do some more examples. Um, just repeat the counting what we did. This edge, uh, this one, dot, 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 but now the last edge actually gets an edge, uh, the last vertex gets an edge as well. So in this case, number of edges equals number of vertices. So Euler characteristic is zero, right? So number of vertices is n, number of edges is n as well. There you go, and n, n minus n is zero. Um, can we do the count for the other one? Well, let me hope I've done this correctly. So number of edges, uh, sorry, number of vertices is certainly n. That's how they are defined. Let's try to count uh, edges. So every edge is adjacent to everything else. Okay, so every edge has degree n minus one. And you have n edges, so I would like to write down the number n times n minus one. However, I overcount because I count, for example, this edge, I would count it for one and three. I would count it for one, and I would count it for three again, and I get rid of this overcount by dividing by two. So that's the number of edges. Hopefully that was convincing. So this is the number of edges in general. And then some algebra autopilot gives you this number here by just subtracting them. That's not very hard. Let me try to do the argument again. Um, number of vertices clearly is n. Number of edges, well, everything is adjacent to n minus one neighbors, and you have n vertices, so I would like to write down the green number, but I overcount because every edge is counted twice, so I just divide by two, and that's the number of edges. And we can do the same count here, and this would be uh, the Euler characteristic as well. Okay. Um, again, I don't assume that you see right now why Euler characteristics should be interesting. Let's just believe that Euler was correct. And this, again, this, by the way, illustrates why this was so brilliant, uh, brilliant observations of Euler's, um, because it's really not clear why there should be, you know, okay, it's a counting on the graph, but why on earth do we care? It's just some counting on the graph. Turns out to be a really crucial counting on the graph itself. And it's really simple, right? So just vertices minus edges. Before coming back to, um, yeah, I, I still can do this. Before coming back to the Euler characteristic later, um, so what we are seeing now is planar degree Euler characteristic. For Euler characteristic, it's still a little bit mysterious why that should be interesting. For planar, it's a bit mysterious how we can actually do anything with it. And the degree was kind of nice with the handshaking lemma in the middle. Um, let me define one more operation, and then we are essentially done. Okay, so this definition is one of the don't look at it definitions. Let me give you an example and then we reread the definition together. Okay, so the only thing I'm doing here is whenever I have an edge in my graph, some edge here, whatever it is, I replace it with, I just put another vertex in the middle. And this operation is called a subdivision. You, you divide it by putting another vertex in the middle. And, well, let's have a look at the definition whether I haven't messed up. So I have a starting graph G, and there is this funny notation with a G dot. I apologize, it's kind of standard notation. So G dot, almost not visible, the little dot. And what you do is you successively replace, exactly do this operation, you add one edge, and what you do is you have the edge from V to W originally, and you put in two edges, namely one from, let me just do it here, so V to W, so, and now you put in an edge U. And you need to remove the original edge. So the original edge is now subdivided. It doesn't exist anymore. It's subdivided in uh, the new graph. Okay, it's kind of a natural operation on graphs. You can put a lot of vert uh, extra vertices into the graph. Okay, let's look at some examples. Um, this is a subdivision of the previous one because I can just put in another um, vertex here, I would call it four, and then I relabel 
to get this one. Right? They're isomorphic. If I put in a, a vertex 4, I would have a 4 here in the middle, but I told you to ignore labels in some sense. So clearly 2, 4, 3 is isomorphic to 2, 3, 4. So the right-hand side is a subdivision of the left-hand side up to isomorphism. You can do the same with loops, for example. Here I would like to subdivide this loop. And uh, I messed up my labels, as you can see. So let's just, I'm not supposed to have a label. So let me put a label 4 here. Um, this A label shouldn't appear double. I, could, I can subdivide any edge. Um, I can go from uh, here to here uh, to here. So I can, the, the, the longest pass graphs are always subdivisions of the, oh, I, I can start here of the smallest one. So always subdivide one more edge until you're, until you're done. So this is an inductive way to construct um, the pass graphs. And note that this definition allows the case to subdivide no edge by putting in uh, another edge. Uh, if you stay at the definition a little bit, uh, let, let's just include it by definition. Um, if this, this operation is also included. It's kind of a silly operation. But if you have no edge, you could still subdivide it. So you can build the pass graphs all from P1 up to, well, P4, I guess, up to all the way to your favorite Pn, and they're all subdivisions of one another. Okay, interesting. So let's ignore for a second the, the, the first two examples, and let's just stare at the last example. So all pass graphs are subdivisions of one another, and I just told you, like a few slides ago, that the Euler characteristic of all pass graphs is one. Now that's funny. Maybe that's a coincidence, could be a coincidence at this point. Maybe there's a relationship. Maybe something like the Euler characteristic is invariant under adding under subdivision, which would be an important statement because subdivision seems to be a natural operation on graphs. And indeed, the Euler characteristic, and the proof is again one of those aha proof moments. Uh, it again goes back to Euler. Um, and the statement is any subdivision keeps the Euler characteristic fixed. So the Euler characteristic kind of picks graphs. Uh, Euler characteristic is a number that you associate to a graph, and it picks out graphs up to subdivision. So it divides your, your set of graphs into equivalence classes up to uh, being a subdivision of one another. Let me do this example again. So here, pass graph, everything is a subdivision of itself. And the Euler characteristic is extremely easy to compute for P1. Number of vertices is one, number of edges is zero. And if the property is true, it, it holds for, for all of them just by subdivision. We can try here. Um, the Euler characteristic of this one is minus one, right? Three uh, vertices, four edges. Here I have one, two, three, four vertices, and one, two, three, four, five edges. So Euler characteristic is again minus one. Similar count works for the second example. Okay, that sounds a bit mysterious. Um, so let's have actually look at the proof. The proof is beautiful. Okay, so let's just stay at this operation. So what does this operation do locally? Well, we can write down um, the Euler characteristic of this beast. So it's two minus one. So we can write down the Euler characteristic of this beast. It's three minus two. Ah, so why? Is that actually, this is certainly constant, right? So uh, why is it actually constant? Well, let's think about it like this. So what we have here is an edge and something that goes without an edge. And here we have the same edge, but what we added in the subdivision is the new one u. But this little pair here just doesn't do anything because it's a vertex and an edge. So the overall contribution to the Euler characteristic of my blue pair is zero. So this contributes 0 to, zero to chi. Right? So it actually doesn't change anything. So this operation keeps chi constant. Right? You add one vertex, but the vertex gets an associated edge. So one vertex and one edge operation is constant. And that's already it. Why is that already it? Because this was the definition of our... Um, what subdivision does. And now you can go inductively 
along with a chain of subdivisions. Each one will contribute zero to the order characteristic, so inductively you will get uh, the, the proposition. And that's really an important property of the order characteristic. It picks out very nicely uh, this notion of subdivision and kind of, at least to me, subdivision looks like an important operation on a graph. I mean, you have an edge and you put another vertex there. You make the graph finer. And you might wonder what is kind of the, the easiest graph with the same type of properties. So you compute the Euler characteristic and you might be able to get it back to one of those easy graphs. So if Euler characteristic is one, for example, it will be one of those. We'll see that in a second. So that's pretty cool, actually. It's kind of, the Euler characteristic kind of picks out the easiest class of graphs in a certain family uh, under subdivision. Okay. Um, I have one more notion, and then we will stop here. Um, okay, the, another property which we will study in more details next time, but we'll already see here, is you can ask for passing graphs. Why do we want that? I was, Again, the definition is that you don't look at it. We look at an example and it may understand the definition. Uh, so let's do that. Um, so a pass is just a string. I have another nicer example. A pass is just a string in a graph. So um, V1 up to some Vn, I start somewhere and I have a collection of a vertex, an edge, a vertex, an edge, a vertex, an edge. I take this vertex again. I'm allowed to do that, an edge and a vertex. Right? The path in the graph is really what it is. Just you, you think of yourself standing on the graph, you walk along the graph. Whatever, wherever you go, whatever you do, that's the path you track on the graph. And now let's see it, look at the formal definition. Well, here's the start vertex, which I call V0. Here's the end of the path, which I call uh, Vn. And in this case, the path is of length n. And all I'm doing is I have a subsequence of edges all going from, well, exactly in this picture, from V0 to V1, from V1 to V2, whoop, all the way up to Vn. Pass in the graph. Okay. Um, studying pass in the graph might be interesting. Think about the Facebook example again. The Facebook graph, and you might wonder whether how uh, person A and person B are related on Facebook. What you would do is you would draw a graph, in uh, a pass in, in the Facebook graph, and the path tells you about, let's say, how far those two persons are away in Facebook. But the path certainly, to me, sounds like a very useful property to study the graph. And we'll finish with the following. Um, paths are also related to connectivity. So what could happen in your Facebook example? Well, it could have person, Facebook, the Facebook graph is very dense. So it, it will not happen in Facebook. But anyway, it could in principle. Person A and person B might not be related. So you might not be able actually to draw a path between them. And this is related to the connectivity of a graph. So um, let's start with some observations. By definition, if you want, every, every vertex has a path of length zero. But that's always a funny path. It's a path I stand here and I don't move. Right? That's a pass, a very lazy one, um, but it's a legal pass. Um, okay, we have seen that. By definition, we can do that. We don't need to. So here, I had uh, the vertex B appearing twice. So I could have paths that go crazy and come back to vertices and do whatever, eventually end up somewhere going from V to W. That's totally fine. That's totally allowed. Um, it can also miss vertex, vertices. Again, in my example here, that's again totally allowed. I never touch F, for example. Right? That's totally fine. Okay. And actually, it is. It defines a map from the path graph into your um, into your into your graph by just well, a path is a path graph if you just consider it by itself. And the path itself defines the, uh, the map, not necessarily an embedding or an isomorphism or anything, because some, why is it not an isomorphism? Well, I can miss some edges, uh, so some vertices or edges, and some things might appear several times. But you could still see the path graph in this graph, just uh, wiggling around like my 
like my red line. So here's my little, what is it, P5, I guess. One, two, three, this appears twice, four, five. Okay. And a graph is connected if there's a path between any two vertices. Does it make sense? Well, let's see. Um, so where was a non-connected example? This one is clearly non-connected. And there's no way to go from four to one. So obviously not. So we take that as a definition of a connected graph if there's no path. This is a connected component, um, and one is also a connected component of the graph. Go back to the definition. Where are we? Somewhere here. Uh, the connected components are exactly defined to be um, the maximal uh, subgraphs that you see. So in my example from before, I had this little guy here, which was very lonely, uh, looks a little bit like an atom, uh, has three vertices, but they're all loops, and here's another one. And the two connected components of my graphs are the little bubbles here. It has two connected components. Um, the past graph, by definition, well, kind of by, by, by construction, if you want, has one connected component, which is itself. So the past graph, of course, is kind of built that you can have a pass from every vertex to every other vertex. I actually had that as an example here. Um, so I can do it again. So here's the connected component, and here's another connected component. Okay, almost out of time. Uh, so let's do some examples. Let's put them all on the slide. Uh, the first graph has nine connected components, a very boring graph, and has nine connected components. Uh, the complete graph is certainly. I mean, it has so many edges. The more edges you have, the fewer connected components. So this has so many edges. This is just one, one beast. Um, so here, nine connected components, one connected component. Here I see three of them. Uh, one, two, three. And here I need to stare a little bit. There apparently should be three connected components. And I guess here is one. There's, there are three triangles. And they lie here, here. And there's another one, oops, here, three triangles, so three connected components. This gets a, bit, gets a bit tricky to see because uh, it's arranged in a strange form, but actually those two graphs are isomorphic. Right, the the right-hand side is just a much nicer drawing. Um, I could actually match that. Give me a second. So here, for example, this could be the blue one, and what was my other color? I guess red. This could be the red one, and you have the perfect matching. So they're just triangles on the right, right left hand side. Okay, so the, the connected components seem to be, uh, or a path in general, seem to be an important property of graphs, and we will study those uh, next time again, um, coming back to ideas of Euler again. So let me just wrap up what we have seen. Um, although we haven't discussed too much about them, they will all reappear. So let, let's wrap up. So. We want to study intrinsic properties of graphs. The first one is a tricky one because we kind of, kind of don't have any methods to attack it right now, but it's a very intuitive one. The question whether we can actually draw a graph without crossings, we still have a good example here on the board. So this graph is certainly plain, a planar because here's a planar embedding, um, but it also has non-planar embeddings which are way harder to see. Um, there's some not trivial process going on uh, connecting them. So this graph is clearly plain up, obviously. So if, if you have, don't have any edges, there's nothing you need to do. They're just vertices. They're just zero dimensional. You just put them anywhere you want. Uh, <laughs> just a warning. It's very silly, but I could have embedded this graph such that vertex one and vertex two just end up at the same spot. I could have done that. That's very stupid, uh, but I could. So even this graph has non-planar embeddings. Um, if you want to count that as a crossing. Uh, this graph is a K whatever, so I hope I convinced you that this is uh, not planar. So the first notion was this notion of being planar. And then we played a little bit around with uh, the degree of a vertex. So this one, again, the degree is kind of a measure how complicated your graph is. Uh, the, the one I just marked in blue is not very exciting from the degree. 
uh, the degree obviously of everything is zero. Um, and we had this funny handshake lemma, which is the number of edges. So this was my induction start from, from the proof actually. Uh, so number of edges is also zero. Um, so the handshaking lemma works out perfectly here. Um, and here it gets a bit more complicated obviously, but handshaking lemma still works out. So we have seen this amazing handshake lemma, which connects a local information to the degree to global information, um, the uh, number of edges. We had this notion of Euler characteristic, which looks a little bit strange, but I promise you this will reappear all the time. It's a really amazing notion. Um, my motivation for today was that it is kind of constant under subdivision, so it picks out if you want to consider subdivision as your uh, equivalence, it would pick out the easiest um, graph up to subdivision. Right now, that's the motivation, but there will be much more. And then we continue from here studying uh, paths in graphs, very important. Um, in the following ways. Again, think of the Facebook example. You want to study kind of the connectivity of the Facebook graph. So how dense it is, is it, or how persons are, people are related. And actually people do that in, in, in real life. Um, turns out that the Facebook graph is really, really dense in the sense that from going from A to B on average, so A is random person on Facebook, B is random person on Facebook, you would, you would think that they might be very far away because A could be in Australia and B could be in somewhere else, but uh, Facebook doesn't really care, and the, the, the kind of the average pass length on Facebook is around 5, uh, 4.5 or something, which is really, really short. So everyone on Facebook is related to everyone else on average by four and a half steps. I would like to study those properties, and we will do that um, in the following lecture. So from here on, I will take you to more paths in graphs, and we will see pretty cool uh, statements about Pass graphs. But I think I'm over time, so uh, thank you very much.